Wait, are we live? Yes. Yes. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. We are very excited today <clears throat> to have all of you here and to have Caswell as a reminder. And if you're, if this is your first time at the salon, this is the learning salon. We are an interdisciplinary community. Every week we gather here at Friday, 4 p.m. Uh, Eastern time to discuss uh, work at the intersection of artificial and biological learning. We have philosophers among us. We have psychologists. We have neuroscientists at all levels, from cell level to cognitive neuroscientists. Uh, so I encourage everyone uh, to participate in the discussions, even if you're junior. Remember that you can ask your questions in the ask a question area. Uh, Kanaka, hi Kanaka, Kanaka and Brad who are in the chat, they will help you with any clarification questions if we are not paying attention to the chat and uh, are deep in the discussion, but you ask something there. They will also monitor to make sure that everything is respectful and in spite of the very interdisciplinary and potentially like, you know, uh, strong disagreements that we all stay uh, respectful while disagreeing a lot. Um, Claire and Eva are our behind the scene grad students and I want to thank them very much. And yeah, yeah, remember to add questions to the ask a question area and vote on each other's questions. And those questions that get high, highly voted and some that seem very relevant to the discussion's flow, we will invite you if you are comfortable to join on screen. And if you're not comfortable, you can write next to your question that it should be asked for you so that we don't uh, sort of uh, engage that process. With that, I am extremely excited to introduce Caswell. Uh, Caswell is a professor at UCL. I think he joined there in 2013. And uh, he's been uh, working on various very exciting papers. You, you might know him for his work with grid cells. You might know him for the work, uh, uh, I don't know, you might know him for his computational work, the work with Andre Benino that was recently in Nature. You might know him for uh, the paper with um, uh, with Olaf Stotter et al. Uh, the, you might know him from many versions uh, of the papers that also we put on the uh, Twitter uh, description. In his spare time, Caswell really is going into electronics and he just told us that he's building doorbells for some reason. And so, or, uh, yeah, and that's, also- that, that, that really a riveter, an absolute riveter of a fact. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you know it's it's good to always work on something that has a simple mechanism in your life you know he's dealing with the entorhinal cortex with the hippocampus with the models so why not something that's a little simpler <laughs> and yeah with that with that with, with that with that introduction i'd like to uh, invite Hazel to share his screen with us and we will hear from him for about 10 to 15 minutes and then we'll discuss further okay so I'm going to share my screen. We should do this. And when I go full screen, hopefully you can all see this. Uh, I can't see you while, while it's full screen. So I'm going to trust, it perfectly, yeah. trust that it's going to work. I'm just going to add, um, thank you so much for inviting me. This is a really awesome format. I'm actually really quite excited to be here. And also read the doorbell. I should probably add that I have become much more boring during COVID. It's just not getting out. It's, it's sad. <laughs> so um, today I'm going to sort of slightly, I'm going back to my roots. Slightly. I'm going to tell you about some experimental data. And then I'm going to try and draw out some sort of what I hope are interesting, maybe general principles from it. We'll see whether I can do it. So I know the clock's ticking. I'm going to get started. So those of you here last week will have seen Kim Stackenfeld um, introduce place cells, but I'm going to talk mainly about them today. And so I'm going to give you a very quick positive history. Place cells, of course, were um, discovered by O'Keefe and Dostrovsky in 1971, mainly found in the hippocampus, CA1 and CA3. And they're, they're best known because they provide a representation of self-location. So experiments used to look like this. Now they've often got VR in them, but a rodent runs around. We record the position of the rodent record the action potentials and you end up with raw data where you've got an animal's path with action potentials superimposed. These came from one place cell and hence you can bin this up to get a rate map and you can see basically that the cell is active when the animal is one place in its location. So it sort of encodes the animal's position out of centric space. And of course, a rat will have maybe a hundred thousand of these. So there's a population code that tells you exactly where it is. And we believe they're at the very least a mammalian phenomena and they probably exist in birds and lizards too. 
And so the obvious point is that most of the experiments done, because we're good scientists, are highly stripped down small boxes, typically a metre across. Indeed, when I first started 20 years ago, they were probably about 70 centimetres across. So while experiments are small, the world is big. A rat would travel maybe 500, two kilometres, typical range. Our experiments are several orders of magnitude below that. And of course, we don't really care that much about rodents. We're more interested in the human brain. So we're looking at totally the wrong scale. We're not the first people to think this, obviously. So there's been a number of attempts to sort of record spatial cells in different size environments. I'm only mentioning a few. Uh, the Moser group, Tor and Haniston Solar, recorded grid cells in a 2.2, I think, by 2.2 metre environment. And they noted various interesting things. The grid is slightly larger and more regular in the middle, being amongst them. Um, Richard L uh, from Albert Lee's lab at Janelia recorded, I guess because they're at Janelia, they have massive spaces. They had this really long linear track that was like, 50 meters long, they kept increasing the recording place cells and no interesting things about the way place cells are recruited. But we wanted to sort of put these two things together and look at what happens as you start increasing the size of two dimensional space. And so most of this data I'm gonna show you at the start came from this talented PhD student, Sander Tani, who's uh, now a, not a PhD student because he's a, he's a Dr. Tani. And so we basically, we have four different environments and they, they each double in size as you go along. So the smallest is environment A, which is about 90 centimetres by 125 centimetres. And then we double, double again, and double the final time. So D is three and a half by two and a half metres, which is basically the size of one of our experimental rooms. And there's, you can almost ignore this. But basically, what happens on a given day is the animals have been trained in A, so they know it well. So the animal goes in there to start with, and then on experimental days, we run it through the other environments, B, C, and D, in a random order, and then they end the day in A. And so we increase the amount of time they get in these bigger environments to match the area. So the smaller, smaller environment, you get 15 minutes, the next biggest 30, up to two hours in the largest ones. So this is a lot of work. Sander created a sort of automatic feeding and tracking system, which is quite impressive. But the sort of takeaway message from this is we record a lot of place cells for a bunch of rats in various different size environments. And we're only analyzing data from uh, the first day we get good coverage, which is typically day two or three. And so what you get for your money when you do an experiment like this is basically we were getting just over 100 play cells on average from each of five rats. So we've got about 630 play cells to play with. And you, you get things like this. These are rate maps um, and these are just two cells. We followed the cells across environments, by the way, so you can see where the fields are changing. And so Sander used a, a nice sort of iterative algorithm to detect where the cells are active and how many fields they've got. So for example, here's a field in a large environment. It's got a cell firing in a single field. This one's split into two and you get various combinations. And I'm not really gonna show you that much more raw data. We're gonna be talking about sort of statistics and populations and how they change. But this is what underlies it all. And so on the next slide or two, I think what I'm gonna do first of all is I'm gonna tell you some things that you probably think, ah, that, that's not that exciting. It's sort of, I always thought that was the case. And then I'm gonna tell you those things maybe in a slightly different way which I think will be more, more interesting, at least I hope it's gonna be. So what I'm showing you here, different color lines for different rats. These are just the environments. Remember D is the big one, A is the small one. And so in the larger environments, you record more place cells, okay? More place cells are active in larger environments. That's not that surprising. We already knew that. The number of place fields increases in the larger environments, right? So in these, in D, you're getting a lot more place fields. And those of you looking carefully will see this is going up faster than this. So that just means naturally that in the larger environment, more cells have more fields. Oops, it's gone backwards. Um, so for example, in environment D, because we're tracking across environments, we can see that there are some cells and no fields, but actually in environment D, most, the most common thing is to have one field and you get twos and threes. And in fact, on average, environment D, you're getting about two and a half fields per cell, whereas environment A, you're getting about 1.3 fields per cell. That's still not that surprising. We kind of knew that already. But here's something that's interesting to start with. If we plot this in a slightly different way. So what I've got here is I've got the environments again, but now I'm scaling it according to the area of the environment. OK, so D is the largest, nearly nine metres square. And so you can see that if you look at the, the percentage of place fields that we're recruiting, they follow this sort of pretty nice linear relationship, fairly simple linear function. So as your environments go larger, you can predict how, what percentage of your place fields, this percentage of the total number we recorded, you're recruiting. And each of the dots here is a rat. So you can see it's really quite reliable across animals. But of course, if you look down here, you can see that the, um, the intercept's positive. And so what that means is if you just look at the, 
number of fields per unit area, there are fewer fields in the larger environment per unit area. OK, so it looks like the fields are sort of sparser, if you like, they're sort of more spread out. We can check if that's actually the case. So what I'm doing here is I'm breaking it down in a slightly different way. You've got, again, the plot I just showed you. So this is the, the number of unique fields per meter squared. And these are the environments. This is just what I showed before. D has got fewer fields per unit area than A. But we can also split up the world by distance to the wall. So we can ask in the big environment, D, we can divide it into sort of four different bands, really close to the wall, a bit further, a bit further, and into the center. And we can see that actually, while there's an effect across environments, really what's happening is there's more fields per unit area near the wall, and there's fewer as you move into the middle. So that's kind of interesting, but it's, again, maybe not that surprising. But actually, if you look at field area, so now if you go and look at how big are the fields, you see the opposite pattern. In environment D on a whole, the fields are larger than they are in the smaller ones. And actually, the fields are larger the further you move away from the walls. OK, and so you can almost immediately see these are quite similar patterns. Uh, that's rather one's the inverse of the other. And in fact, they are the inverse of the other. So they cancel each other out. So if you now look, if you pick spots in the environment, you say, how many place cells are active here? What's the proportion of place cells that are co-active at any point in the environment, in any of these environments? You see that it's basically constant. So across these environments, it's always about, if you pick a spot, it's always about 12% of the population. That's true regardless of where you are, whether you're near to the walls or far from the walls. So that's starting to get a bit more interesting. And actually, the other thing that's constant is if you just calculate the average rate per cell. So you just calculate the number of spikes you're getting over, over the population as a whole, over the number of cells you've got, the average rate. And that is also fairly constant. So this starts to suggest, oh, by the way, these just because one of these was true doesn't mean the other one had to be true. You could have had the same number of cells firing at different rates, for instance, or vice versa. That's what I'm sorry to interrupt. Just, just a question. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to allow myself to be the dumbass. Uh, about this um does, does, does this just so i understand are there dead zones in these bigger rooms in other words or is every single every, square centimeter of the room represented by at least one field or uh, i mean yeah so yeah, i yeah. can't so quite tell whether you're saying that they're going to be dead zones or not no 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 so it's the, it's the opposite so in fact everywhere you look in the environment about 12 percent of your population is active so there's there's the same density of coverage and the same average firing rate at the population level everywhere. So it's so. Let me go on to the next slide and see if that sort of becomes clearer. Then let ask me again if it doesn't. But so, um, what it means is a couple of things. It means if you just go and add up all the fields that you've got, if you like, count all my place fields, add up the area, and it is a direct and rather impressively linear function of the environment size. And actually, I took off the correlation coefficient on here because it was embarrassingly high and so all these things point to one simple conclusion there is an incredibly strong homeostatic mechanism which just something like k winners take all which just means that there is always the same distribution of activity in the population any point in space and in fact i'm not showing the slide for that but we have we have measured that and so it's basically saying at any given point in space there are the same proportion of silent, the same proportion of firing at a very low rate, the same proportion of firing at a very high rate. And so it seems, I suppose, to give you an interpretation on that, if I if I give you the population vector from the hippocampus and just give you that without any other information, you couldn't tell me whether that population vector came from a small environment or a large environment or close to the wall or far from the wall. It's just got the same statistics everywhere. And so that's kind of that's kind of a bit weird in some ways and also it's sort of that alone doesn't require some explaining but it does need to be squared with the fact that we know like i said before that fields are smaller near the near the walls and so how how can these two things be true and i'm going to skip that and show you this so what it turns out is if you measure the size of place fields you can predict exactly what their size is going to be because their width perpendicular to a wall. So, for example, this width here, it depends on their distance to the perpendicular wall. And this width here depends on the distance to its perpendicular wall. So what it implies is you have, if you've got a cell close to the wall, say here, you'll have a sort of long, thin cell. And if you've got cells out here, you'll have a sort of big, nice round feel, uh, set of field because it's equidistant from the two walls. 
But that's individual fields, right? So we want to, we're more interested at the level of populations. So here's here's the one that I think is sort of most interesting. So I told you the pop the statistics of the population are the same everywhere. So all you can look at in that case is how fast does the population vector change as you move around. And in fact, what has to be the case, and what is the case, um, is that if you're near to a wall and you're traveling towards or away from it, so that's where the fields are going to be narrow, then actually this population vector as a whole is moving rapidly. Whereas if you're out in the middle of the environment, the population vector is moving slowly. And if you're close to this wall, but you're traveling parallel to it, so you're far from the orthogonal wall, then the population vector is also moving slowly. And that's all there is, actually. It turns out the population vector statistics are the same everywhere. All that changes is how fast you move through your population of place cells. And so the sort of the thing, the thing that now we have to explain, and what I've got on this last slide is how do we explain that? What is what is that a function of? And so uh, this was work done by uh, the excellent Will de Coffey, who's one of my postdocs and is incredibly talented. And so what we did was kind of initially seemed a bit silly, but we did it anyway. So here's a picture of the real environment. I'm afraid it's really dark, but that's it's deliberately dark because rats don't like it in the light. So you kind of just about see it's a fisheye lens. It's a bit sort of uh, skewed. It's a, it's a rectangle. And so we made a VR version of this. And so you can see it's got the same checkerboard thing up here. It's got the same walls. And it's got like a, a funny little white cue hanging on here. OK. And so we know where the rat was in here. And we have the rat's true path. And so we can create a little sort of rat cam and move it around in here as the rat was doing. And so our rat cam has 360 degree field of view, which is a slight overestimate for a rat, but actually they can see about 300, 320 degree field of view. And essentially it sees the dome above it, sees all around the dome above it. And we can, we can basically calculate a simple rate of change of the visual scene at every time step, every position step as the animal, as the virtual rat moves around. And so now what we have is two things that we compare. We have the real, the rate of change of the population of these rat, uh, of the population of place cells as the rats run around. And we just have the rate of change of the visual scene as the virtual rat runs the same path. And we can correlate, and we can just correlate them. And actually that super simple model, and actually we only ran this this week. Uh, so we haven't, even had a, we haven't even tried to optimize these sorts of parameters, does a remarkably good job at accounting for um, how the population as a whole is changing. And interestingly, to sort of give you an idea of what a control model might look like, um, a lot of the sort of early work on trying to understand why place cells fire where they do sort of took uh, the rate of change of the angle to the top of the wall as being something that should be explanatory of place field size. And if you just use that rate of change of the angle to the nearest wall, then actually do a much less good job. And so what this means is that actually, uh, you can explain place cell firing at sort of the population level by saying there is a simple homeostatic mechanism that's always going to select out the same proportion of activity across the same uh, cross section, a similar cross section of the population. And the rate we move through it is, is directly proportional to your experience of how you move through your sensory world, at least if you're a rat in a simple environment like this. And so I know I only had 10 minutes. I think I've probably gone over it already. I want to sort of quickly conclude that and then I'm going to cheekily slide in one extra slide. So, like I said, simple homeostatic mechanism, which gives us sort of some basic rules that we can try and use to understand these populations. And in fact, we can we can predict how that population vector changes uh, reasonably well, if you just consider orthogonal distance to the top of the wall, um, and, or, or both orthogonal distance to the wall and also the rate of change, the angle to the top of the wall. But you can do a much better job of explaining it if you just consider how the visual environment as a whole is changing. And if I may have, 40 seconds more oh sorry i forgot the uh, i should thank mainly sandra and will who uh who um collected the data and did this little bit of modeling at the end of course the rest of the lab neil is always a source of good discussions and of course our funding um but because you had kim last week i just want to point this out and so um kim of course talked about how the successor representation uh, can predict the uh, spatial firing and how these things get skewed by various sort of properties of how the animal transitions around an environment. And so based on Sanders work, we basically have something that can parameterize the size of place cells. So we can draw, uh, we can draw at random more new model synthetic place cells from that, those parameters, the ones in the middle around, the ones near the wall are squashed, et cetera. We can generate a few hundred of those 
can generate a random rat path using the, uh, in this case, the, the Rowdy's model of how rats move. Uh, we can calculate a transition matrix for that, so we can get the successor representation using these as the bases. And that allows us to predict uh, grid cells by taking the eigenvectors of this and projecting back into it. And so we get some eigenvector grid cells built off our synthetic place cells that match the statistics of the real population. And the interesting things about these, if you remember when I showed you right at the beginning the data from the uh, Mosul lab, this Tensodalus, they saw that grids were more regular and larger scale in the center of the environment. And sure enough, if you go and generate a lot of these and measure the properties of them, um, splits it up into, well, they're not quadrants, but nine sections. And cutting quickly to the chase, the grids are, the eigenvector grids coming from the successor matrix based on these place cells are larger in the middle than they are at the edges. And the, so basically the smallest ones are here, which is what this is showing. The next largest are here and the largest are in the middle, which is actually a pretty good match to the, it's the same sort of magnitude effect actually the stem solar source. So I think it sort of nicely ties together a, a set of different things. And um, that is more than my 10 minutes up, for which I apologize. Thank you so much. Actually, you are very on time. Usually people take a lot more time. And that's a suggestion. Oh, oh there's an echo, isn't oh. it? as well. That, that's I can hear myself. Jovo's. I fixed it, sorry. That was my yeah, multi-applause echo, you know. Okay. Oh. <laughs> um, this was awesome. And uh, yeah, why don't you so keep, one, keep yeah. the slides on? Because I think that, yeah. Also, if you want to talk about the <laughs> slide, there's another, by the way, there's another sort of 30 slides that these are, the, these are all the sort of ones that like go in there when I was thinking about it. I haven't, I haven't spoken about it. I'm quite happy to. These are things to demonstrate. For example, this, this is here to demonstrate that actually there is genuine remapping between those environments. So one of your worries, if you put rats into similar environments that's slightly larger than one another, is that actually they'll just treat it as the same place that's bigger. And then then you would be drawing conclusions from a strangely sort of transformed environment. Whereas what you really want, if you if you believe you're going to draw conclusions from uh, genuinely distinct environments, then you want to see that there's a robust remapping between them, which there is very robust. And indeed, you can. What it means is if you take if you take the uh, the activity one environment, you know what the firing looks like in the other. Then you can decode both where you are in space and um, which environment you're in with um, quite a high degree of accuracy because we have so many place cells. One question that uh, I, I, it's a clarification one, and, I, and there were a couple of clarification questions, so maybe you could keep the slides. This would be a special session of the salon. So I think that you presented stuff that are very exciting and there were some clarification questions we can get through now maybe before we ask the deeper questions. So one thing I wanted to ask is, uh, how long do you think a place still will last? As far as I've seen, like- I know exactly what you know you mean. what I mean? It's a different, so yes, yes. Sorry, I cut you off before you finish it. But this is the big, this is the big question, right? Whether no, no, go ahead. Um, you know, it's the, it's the it's the question to which the answer has changed most after over the last fifteen years. So the before optical imaging came in, the idea was you know, place cells are basically uh, a, a fairly immutable representation of the animal's spatial memory. And there were some early studies where people had tried to record with electrodes the same place cell for a few weeks. And, um, you know, they'd sort of mainly seen that they were stable as so they fired in the same place. Of course, with the sort of advent of the era of um, optical imaging, two photon imaging, single photon imaging, has had two, two big differences. One is you can image a damn sight more cells. So, in fact, this paper will probably be the peak number of place cells my lab ever records with electrodes, I imagine, because it's just this was 32 tetrodes, which means you've got 128 pieces of wire um going into the bit of brain and it's just a nightmare to do whereas as so for all sanders skill one of my so for example another phd student alice who uses um two photon imaging in vr can on a bad day record 10 times as many cells with two photon imaging so it really changes what you can do but aside from more cells it means you can go back and find the same one tomorrow and the day after that and suddenly you can ask these questions about the longevity of the spatial code and the early results from that um showed that in fact things weren't quite as stable as we'd all, always thought there was some degree of turnover and in and those early results which were done sort of single photo imaging people i think some people questioned oh you know maybe the cells just moving out of the plane of imaging or we don't know that much about these calcium indicators you know maybe they're not so reliable but actually as as time's gone by it, it turns out that actually the population is much more dynamic uh 
And it's probably not the whole thing getting turned over. It's not, you know, it's it's maybe not as simple as sort of the standard model of consolidation. You just keep stuff in the hippocampus for a while and dump it all into the cortex. It looks like, and, and I guess this is leaning on a lot of Yuri Bazaki's work, that there are um, maybe, maybe not two distinct populations, but at least sort of two, mo two sort of modes of play cells in there. There's, the cells which will be stable for longer, there's ones that come online slowly, slower and have more plasticity, and then those change more with replay. And so probably what we're gonna end up with is something where there's initially you enter a room and there's a lot of plasticity. And then through a process of consolidation to the cortex, or maybe just intra-hippocampal processes, you end up with that representation being compressed down so that you, you only end up, like you start to compress onto a subset of play cells, maybe the important ones, or maybe the ones that are more diverse in space, which presumably is efficient, and then you can recycle some of those other cells to be reused for new memories. So I guess the short answer is, some aren't as stable as we thought they were, some probably are more at just as stable as we always thought they were. That is a fantastic response. So uh, one thing maybe a follow up on that is, uh, when I go back to my parents' home when the COVID is over and I haven't been there yep. in years, uh, will that be, <laughs> will that, will, that, will there be any same cells in my hippocampus that fire I would imagine, or they all I, I would imagine there'd still be a core that were the same. I don't think, I. I think the indication at the moment is that it doesn't fully get turned over. Um, actually, there'll probably be, I think what we've generally underestimated is the amount of sort of really short term learning and relearning that happens. Um, so there will obviously, there'll be things you've forgotten. There'll be details, you know, obviously the structure and the basic ideas will be there, but there'll be things that you've forgotten that you need reminding of. Interestingly, I guess something that made me realize that, so what am I, early papers during my PhD, yeah, that's been during my PhD with Neil, we looked at how um, grid cells change in response to novelty. And so you called grid cells, I showed, uh, uh, so grid cells are these things. I don't know if you can, I have no idea if you can still see these slides or see what my, uh, see what my cousin's putting up. But grid cells, of course, are famously a bit like play cells, but they have multiple fields distributed in this beautiful sort of hexagonal lattice. And so in a novel environment, the scale temporarily increases. At least in at least sort of in our hands when we do the experiments in sort of open fields with rats and then it decreases with experience and so it takes roughly three hours of rat life to decrease and that sort of made it sense sort of time to become familiar but actually there is a slight quirk in the detail even if you take an environment the rat has been trained in every day for months if you look at the different if you collect enough data and look at the difference between the scale between the end of yesterday and the start of today scale goes up again slightly, you know, only by a fraction of percent, it's barely measurable, and then it comes down a little bit during the day. And it's just like there's some learning that will get, yeah, sure, you remember it 99%, but there's, there's a tiny detail of familiarization that you lose with time and then is relearned and the scale comes back down again. It's quite interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. And in fact, that study by Dylan Rich was actually a friend of mine from back in Princeton days. Um, I think something interesting about that was that some Poisson, uh, gamma Poisson distributions seem to explain a lot, but I, if I remember correctly, is the gamma Poisson distribution skewed? It is slightly skewed, and it's skewed in such a way that there's always going to be some cells you're not going to recruit. And it, it presumably it's a strategy, so you don't, because what you don't want to do is run out of new run out of cell. you don't want to run out of code basically you want to be able to maintain some efficiency yeah and um so yeah yes exactly how exactly. do you see so this whole, yeah go on, sorry no i was, I was gonna say so you could interestingly you can estimate the same thing for um um so sand was really keen on uh on doing estimate you could estimate exactly this for the 2d environments and so it's more skewed because you're because even though our our environment isn't 48 meters long it's two-dimensional so you you're uh you're pulling in, you seem to be going through your population a lot faster. So how do you think that homeostasis that you're mentioning is applied? Like what is the what is the circuit? What is the mechanism? Is there something else? Is there something with enterhinal cortex? Like how is that homeostasis maintained within? Yeah, yeah this is quite interesting. Yeah, so we check the so we check the obvious things so far as you might think, right, check the interneurons, see what they're doing. 
they are like so the play cells are pretty stable across the three lines. The engineers are just dead, like the engineer of average frame rates are just dead flat across distances to walls, across different size environments. Which I mean makes sense if the play cells are, but I guess I was sort of hoping that you might see the engineer on soaking up the difference. Like it was them that were getting modulated at the cost of the play cells, but that doesn't seem to be the case. Um it would be interesting to know what grid cells doing. So I think the, the implication is um, for grid cells, and certainly if you look at sort of this Stensola um, paper, or indeed it was the sort of Hagland reanalysis of the Stensola paper, where they show that um, you know the grid cells are slightly larger scale in the middle. Um, but of course, if if you if you believe the grid cells are in um, a toroidal attractor network, which seems highly likely. Um, then it implies that actually much of the same homeostasis must be true there, right? Wherever you, no matter if you change the scale, you change everything. You change the size of the fields, but also the distance between the fields. So if you drop a point on the grid cell map, presumably the same thing is also true. There'll be the same number of cells active under that point, and the statistics of the population should be the same. And so it might, it's it's possible it's all inherited from grid cells. It's possible. I mean, there. I guess the follow-up is we should start inhibiting things and seeing what what can make it change. Uh, and indeed, you'd think I'm sure some of this can be shifted around by neuromodulators. Like if this if, if this environment was brand new, you might expect to see some changes, but it's not quite brand new to the animal. So we're looking at sort of a a stable state of knowledge in a large environment. I have one last question, although I feel very bad, but I feel like we have time because you finished actually early. <laughs> It's because it's I'm so scared of going over. Like you told me, you've got to be ten minutes, or you can. Be <laughs> I didn't think you'd listen. <laughs> so I'll just uh, ask one last question, which is very related to the point that you just made. Um, it's a little bit more, be more speculative and a little bit more inside baseball. But I also asked. Uh, uh, this was the last question I also asked uh, Kim, which is that. We do in our papers uh, talk about the successor representation as a matrix. We talk about place fields as the columns, but in reality, uh, n by n or n squared uh, representation for n states is not efficient, and probably that's not how things are stored. So it's possible. So the idea is uh, some tuples are stored, or maybe some kind of basis sets in the entorhinal cortex reinstate these things, and that might explain both what you were saying about some of the homeostatic mechanisms and why sometimes other cells might get recruited and some might uh, be still recruited as they were before. And also it might explain also why it's uh, still efficient because um, if this happens, you could still have representational similarity that looks like the columns of this, or that looks like the successor representation without the extra cost of actually storing n squared order ma ma matrices for n yeah. states of observation. So this is something that I've been thinking about, and I really hope to like write about this, about different ways in which that the successor representations would be stored in an actually neurally plausible and efficient way. I wonder what you think about that and whether this uh, this one of the potential solutions that would have to do with some kind of basis sets uh, or such in the internal cortex related to the grid fields, whether those things might um, uh, match to give a, a bigger wholesome story of the computational model. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I think you, so I think you're sort of right on the money there. There's a sort of set of a set of different sort of fields or ideas that sort of converging on an idea like that and you can come at it from various ways um i guess to, to sort of pick one so partly because it's in in my mind it was um some work that i've sort of been uh tangentially involved in but sort of led by um charles blundell and um, benny uria from DeepMind, where essentially they've trained it's a bit like the andrea benino work did the grid cells but more and it's uh currently on bio archive trained um a deep network to navigate in a bunch of different environments. And it's sort of multi-layered. And so to sort of cut through a lot of the details, if you sort of take a predictive approach, ultimately what you find is you learn a bunch of different interesting bases that are going to be useful for you to perform the sorts of things you want to perform in sort of typical spatial environments. And depending what you feed the different bits of the network and whether you just give them access to say, um, angle of um, rate of turning or translational velocity, then you get uh, a set of representations that would be incredibly familiar to electrophysics. You get sort of head direction cells. You get a lot of 
border cells, boundary vector cells. And so interestingly, so one of the one of the things that's happened in the experimental literature recently, and I guess we should probably take our hats off to Neil. So it seems like he, he predicted the existence of boundary vector cells, but actually he also predicted in some early work the existence of something which he called egocentric boundary vector cells. And so just to quickly explain what these things are, because they are they are related to all of this stuff. So boundary vector cell is basically a type of cell that was theorized and it sort of responds optimally when there is some sort of barrier or some something that stops you moving at a given distance or direction in allocentric coordinates, so say 20 centimeters to the east. And so these these were discovered by Colin Lever and the Moser group in um, enteronal cortex and subiculum. Actually, at the same time, they also theorized there should be you know, a step before that as you're converting information from egocentric coordinates into allocentric coordinates. So you should have egocentric boundary vector cells, things that respond to the presence of basically in anything that's an impediment to movement or a meaningful barrier at some uh, direction relative to your body. So to my left, to my right, 20 centimeters. And so these have also been found in the um, in the experimental literature, a lot of work done by Mike Hasselmo's group in the last year or two. Um, and so these are it's all these things are the basis sets that come out of these networks when you train them. And the reason being that they're sort of, um, for the sorts of transitions you're making in the sorts of environments that animals are living in, they are, um, an efficient representation for storing uh, information about where you are relative to the uh, relative to the things you can move around. They're basically an efficient um, uh, basis set for representing meaningful states. And I think that is a slightly uh, that's a slightly different perspective, but exactly on what you're talking about. And I suppose I think what this, what's the sort of the next frontier after this is rather than just sort of representing all states efficiently. Uh, we presume, and indeed I'm sure the brain does, is, is store information about sort of the, the commonality of states. So meaning, you know, states where the same actions are useful. You know, like ice cream shops. When I'm in ice cream shops, I need to rec recognize their ice cream shops, shops and be able to buy ice cream. I don't know why I'm thinking about that because it's bloody freezing here today. But anyway, you get the idea. And so those, so we should be, so we would expect the brain to store both information about states, the transitions between the states, but also uh, the re relevant reward structure and the relevant sort of actions that uh, should be present in those states, regardless of where they are in space. And we might expect all those things to be factored out. And that's what I think, well, that's what I hope theory will converge on to sort of the experimental literature. And we should, um, we should start to see some of these things found and identified. Thank you so much. I could talk for another hour or, or five with you, but I'm sure that others <laughs> should ask questions. Thank you for answering all of those so wonderfully. Jovo, John, which one of you? John, do you want to go? So yeah, I will just because I think, and, and it was wonderful, but that was a highly specialized conversation, which I think not all of the 200 people I'm in sorry. the room would have been able to follow. And I think I, I so I, I mean, so in other words, I think we have to take a huge step back and maybe you could help everybody here by uh, perhaps explaining to people what, you know, just intuitively what they should think the relationship is between play cells and grid cells. Um, because yeah. a lot of people just don't know. Uh, play cells, one can intuit. So one, two, um, perhaps you could explain what the successor representation is because a lot of people yeah. here won't yeah. know what that yeah. is, right? Um, and Three, you know, when you talk about, you know, the hippocampus, I think it would be really helpful uh, to explain why it's all going on there. There's a lot of brain left, right? So you're certainly learning what to do in an ice cream shop. That means like the hippocampus all on its own is a mini brain, <laughs> right? Um, so in other words, uh, so in other words, Play cells, grid cells. And then the last question I have, and I'll remind you of it, is sometimes, you know, if you listen to Surya Ganguly and others, the intuitive normative theory is actually a little bit more complicated. And then these zoo of cells fall out in a kind of non intuitive way, right? So, in other words, there are components that are there because of a more interesting computational superstructure. Other times, it's as if we're mm. supposed to sort of guess mm. at what's going on just by the intuitive response tunings of these zoo of cells. And they actually have names that somewhat misleadingly make you think that you can work out what's going on computationally at the population level by the single unit response. So I feel 
So my last question we should get to is this tension between attributing the core computational status to the property of this tuning of individual cells versus these popping out because this identity has been conferred upon them by a more complex, slightly less intuitive population level computation. But before we get to that, because that's fascinating to me, I do think for the purposes of the people in this room, what is the difference between place, place cells and grid cells? What's the relation between them? And what on earth is so, so let's start. These are all good questions. <laughs> and we'll probably be busy for a couple of hours, I imagine. Uh, yeah, but it's just no, otherwise no, people are going to be completely so, lost. Place cells and grid cells. Yeah. So, of course, like just to, to briefly describe them so we know what we're talking about, and I'll describe them in the order they found. So place cells, we saw it discovered more than 50 years ago. Actually, 50 years. This is the 50th anniversary. I hadn't thought about that. And so grid cells are were first identified in the entorhinal cortex, although by all means they're not exclusively found there. And it seems that maybe they're more common than we believed. But the entorhinal cortex notably is both the main cortical input and output of the hippocampus. And so interestingly, grid cells are found in both superficial layers, which come into the hippocampus, and also in the deep layers that come out, um, which on its own doesn't tell you anything about the relative sort of primacy of grid cells or place cells. So superficially, they are rather similar, right? They're both spatial cells. They have like relatively sparse activity, place cells more so. There's a lot of the space, a lot of the world that a given place cell doesn't fire in. It's rather specific. Grid cells have this really regular structure and we believe, you know, there's, a, there's several models for their, uh, to describe their formation. I guess as much as I hate to say it, the most popular is the attractor network and not, uh, rather contentious uh, models about oscillatory interference, but that's a question for a different different day. And so the question is why both, right? So like, interestingly, so John O'Keefe famously wrote a book, The Hippocampus of the Cognitive Map of Finding Place Cells. And I think the, the obvious observation is if he'd found grid cells first, he'd have probably written it about those. Because in many ways, grid cells are much more of a map than place cells. And so I guess you can see this obviously like, you know, if I tell you, if I say, look, here's a place, and here's some place cells that fire, I give you the population mix for that place, and here's another place, and I tell you some place cells that fire. Unless those two places are so close together that some of the place fields overlap them, then as far as we know, you have no information about how, how near or far those things are. They could be on the other side of my room, or one of them could be in the US, and one could be in London. Whereas that's not true with grid cells. Grid cells have a very reliable structure. So grid cells come in modules, so as you move, if you're recording from a rat, if you move your electrodes uh, dorsal to ventral down the entorhinal cortex, initially you'll find the rat at the smallest scale is about 30 centimeters, and that's grid cell peak to grid cell peak, neighboring peak. Move your electrodes down a bit, you find more 30s, and eventually it jumps up to the next module. And so they seem to be organized in these sort of nice discrete modules. Um, and the point being, and this is sort of uh, work from Illafiette, uh, and others, Andreas Hertz, that grid cells seem to be a really highly efficient multiplexed form of code in that you're using all of the population all of the time. It's essentially a sort of, uh, it's a remainder code, a modulo code. Um, and so what it means is a very small number of cells uh, can give you very accurate decoding. It also tells you the population has baked into it information about how far you've traveled. So if I give you a grid population vector here, another one somewhere else. If you know the scale of the grid cells, then you can figure out um, up to some limits how far apart. So is off. it fair to say that it's a kind of graph paper with different degrees yeah. of spacing yeah. between it? And if, it's, yeah. and if it's graph paper, then as you just said, somewhere else has to read off the vectors in the grid cells to, to take it. So, so they're not actually, so they're being used as graph paper by somewhere else is, is 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 that correct i think i think that's uh that's a pretty good analogy indeed you could take it for like if you would take the analogy all the way it's like grid cells are graph paper or indeed grid lines on a map but multiple different scales and probably your place cells are a bit like the features inside that map they do right. some other things and interestingly if you have a map you can do several things with it but two of the interesting things you can do with it is you can look on it so I was there, now I'm here, and you can estimate how far you've traveled. Mm -hmm. If you know how you're moving, I've traveled a mile north, then you can look on your map and based on the grid lines, update where you are so you can path integrate. So that's one of the things we think grid cells do. Uh, 
And of course, you can do the opposite. You look at the map. I want to be there. I'm here. That means I've got this vector to travel to my. So, uh, so just to clarify, are the grid cells doing it, or are they being read off? They are. Well, they're probably not doing it, right? So our models. So when you models, say they're doing it, you just that was just a slip of the tongue. That was right? a slip of the tongue. That was yeah. So more precisely, our models tell us that there is sufficient information in the grid code that you can that you can use them to do those things. You need extra components. So to path integrate, you need a way to update the grid code. Interestingly, some of that machinery we do see in the internal cortex, or what is likely machinery. It's not it's not proven, but it seems quite likely. Mm -hmm. The slightly trickier thing about converting grid codes to a, um, a vector to get to your goal, so goal-directed navigation, we we have some, you know, the information is clearly present in the grid population. It's not totally clear how you get it back out. I mean, indeed, you know, obviously it's not totally clear yet that the brain does it. It seems quite likely. Um, so that's a very important point, right? That at the moment, if I understand what you said, we as experimentalists can use it as graph paper, uh, but we don't know if the brain is. Is that correct? We we don't, right? So it's like it's quite. So people have attempted it. So there's been attempts to do discrete lesions of various bits of the um, hippocampal circuit to try and tease apart what what out of part what part that is necessary for of course it's a very it's a hard thing to do for multiple reasons not least it's rather the structure is rather loop like so if you start making um, holes in it over here then there's going to be all sorts of downstream problems it's also anatomically not so easy to work with you try and lesion part of the enteroidal cortex it's, it's a pretty challenging thing to do people people have tried it and there are you know there is building evidence to confirm that actually a lesion that's that is affecting enteroidal cortex so it's definitely affecting your grid cell populations will impair animals abilities to to path integrate so they'll start to overshoot or undershoot distances um you could also interpret some of those results as being a problem in a sort of goal-directed vector and so interesting some very old work i can't remember who it was from now but it was before the discovery of grid cells they did lesions to enteroidal cortex and they put um rats in the Morris Horse Maze, so the famous maze where you know the animal has to remember where the submerged platform is and you need to put it back and it swims back, which is very sensitive to hippocampal damage. So it turns out that there is a rather more specific issue, like superficially, if you lesion the enteroidal cortex, it's a bit of a mess and it can't do it. But actually, if you put some local landmarks in there, suddenly they can start solving it again. So the, it appears the rats are able to switch from a, they can't execute a pure goal-directed vector strategy presumably because their enteroidal cortex is gone. But if you put some other stuff in, they can still do a sort of a reasonable job at swim to that and then go around. So they can sort of follow a route strategy instead, which makes sense. I'm not sure if those things have been revisited, whether that particular task has been revisited in light of uh, grid cells, but it certainly sort of fits into that sort of framework. Right. Okay. That's And, and so and now the successor representation in a few lines, could, you know, it's such, you know, so people can just have a sense of the relationship between place cells and grid cells within that framework? So the successor representation is, it sort of sits halfway between model-based and model-free reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning is the problem of trying to act, act in such a way that maximize future reward. And so it turns out, and this was work originally, um, originally put out there by Peter Dyer, that I mean, just one, just I'm sorry to interrupt you, just for people. Pete, some people might be a bit surprised that we were suddenly talking about grid cells and place cells, and suddenly you started talking about reinforcement learning. Uh, is is it uh, intuitive why uh, we should be going from place and grid cells to suddenly being talking about reinforcement learning? It isn't, but once you've got a successor representation, it becomes a little bit more intuitive. And so, um, so with a successor representation, basically what you can do is you can separate out the transitions you can make in a world. So like, if I'm here, then I, if I'm here now, where am I likely to be in the future? I'm likely to be probably, if I'm acting randomly, then I'm likely to be nearby and even slightly less likely to be further away. You can separate that out from the reward structure. And so that has some, has some benefits, right? So it means if you're in a, if you're in a room where you've learned all the transitions you can make, and so you have a good estimate of your future states based on your current state, then actually, if I if I suddenly drop a reward at a new location, I can use all the information I've already got about how I can transition around to uh, act optimally, potentially to find uh, to move towards that goal. And so this could be, you know, in a biological system, this would be quite useful in sort of the abstract. And so what um, 
And so Peter Downs' work on this was quite a while, I think 93. And so what happened recently, so um, Kim Stackerfeld, who was here last week, uh, working with Matt Bot Botvinnik and Sam Gershwin, showed that if you, um, if you sort of learn a successor representation, and so in their original work, they treated the world as existing in sort of, um, so they divided worlds up into sort of square states. So uh, not entirely biologically plausible, but still gets to the point. Um, and so you learn this big transition matrix, right? And so it turns out that if you, if you find the eigenvectors, of this transition matrix, and project them back out through it, then you end up with, well, hang on, let me find my slide, because we did this. It's probably the best thing. Can you still see these slides? I'm yep. not sure if you can. Yep. Okay, great. So um, this was slightly different. This is slight, so there's one slight difference in here from what I was just describing in Kim's work. So. What I said with sort of the Stackenfeld works, they treated the world as if it exists in discrete states. There might be a square here, and that's state one, and the state next to it. Like I said, that's not entirely biologically plausible because we know hippocampus doesn't have access to something like that. But what we do know is it has access to sort of you know, various population vectors of things that represent where you are. So instead of having sort of discrete state, you can sort of represent your state across this sort of basis set of things. In this case, we were just using dummy place cells. And so you can learn uh, transition probabilities between essentially between the populate like the population of cells that are active at any given point and it gives you something like this this is the this is a matrix of cells by cells and your likelihood of transitioning between them if you do basically this thing it's not quite a random walk but it's not far from it it's a wrap to it like just traveling in straight lines and turning as it gets near walls so this is synthetic and so once you've got this this transition matrix then you can do a couple of things with it so one of the i guess the thing that's most striking is when you calculate the eigenvectors and project it back out through the place cells, then you end up with uh, things that look like this, that mm. are super, well, more than superficially, like resemble in many ways grid cells. Um, if you do this, if you did this the way that Kim was doing it, just look at the states, then actually when you look down the rows of the transition matrix, you end up with things that look quite a lot like place cells. Anyway, so it looks like a sort of spatial representation. I mean, I think the real selling points for it, of course, are here i'm just showing you sort of random movement whereas animals are typically policy dependent meaning they're normally going you know they're not moving randomly they tend to, if they're in some position they tend to be going somewhere else like running towards the food for instance and so that introduces biases in the transition matrix so for example if i always travel from here towards the door then when i'm in this state the probability of me being over there is high and the probability of being over there next time step is low and when you take that into account and project it back out and you start to see things that we find in the brain like place cells start to skew uh they start they essentially are slightly predictive of where you're about to be so they start to skew in a way that you see in the biological literature and in things like mazes where you can only go one way you get sort of changes in the place cells that come out of the successor representation that look a lot like uh the sorts of effects we see in rats and so there's a there's a sort of concordance on a, a number of different levels there's the sort of grid cells that look similar there's the fact that you can get spatial representations and the fact that those spatial representations can change in ways dependent on the behavior that you see both in the model, in the successor model, and you also see in um, in real life. But so just to finish, so, I, you know, I, I get it that it's very interesting that you can sort of do this eigen decomposition on the transition matrix and you play it out through the play cells and you get this very interesting reproduction of grid cells. Um, but I still want the punchline. So ah, what? Yes. Sorry, can I can I for one second just like mention one thing? So I think John, something that's very exciting about the success representation, even if you don't know the transition matrix, if you don't know the probability of transition between things, but you're just encountering things in the world, it's a count-based method. It says when I start here, I'm going to end up on average five times over there in my apartment because mm. I, I have to pass there to go to my room and to the bathroom. So within every hour, I'm going to pass there five times, right? Mm -hmm. And that hour is the gamma parameter or the horizon, predictive horizon. Within a given predictive horizon, on average, I'm going to expect that when I'm here, I'm going to end up there five times. So when I'm sitting here, I'm not only representing where I am, but I'm representing locations also, whether it's in spatial space or it's in you know, psychological space, places where I'm expected to visit more often mm -hmm. within a given horizon. And the nice thing about this thing is that it can be learned with temporal difference learning, not for the reward, but for the space. Or right, the right, right, right. And it's, then it's, the punchline yeah. of that, sorry, the punchline of that is the columns 
correspond to place fields. So it's it has a very nice and easy property. The columns are the place fields and the eigenvectors are the grid fields. Very simple. It's It has this very beautiful and simple properties. And then it can be combined with the reward vector that's somewhere in the basal ganglia or something in order to compute the value of different places to decide. Yeah, yeah right, right, right. I, I, I think so, just so for everyone understands. So what's very interesting is, yes, it's really nice from what Peter Diane did with basically factorized model free learning and you get this distinction between, as Ida says, learning the states versus the rewards and that factorization is really useful for generalization and but, but so if I'm understanding it, even though people like O'Keefe were seeing place cells and grid cells, is it, am I to understand it? The lens that we should be seeing them through is, oh, look, here are the expected neural responses if you had something useful like a successful representation. Is, is that what we're supposed to be taking as the conclusion? Is that here's neural confirmation, just like reward prediction error in Wolfram Schultz, that there's something that seems to be confirming this Peter Diane again <laughs> uh, prediction, <laughs> right? Um, is that is is that the way we're supposed to be, con be so concluding from what you're saying? I would I would not make it about a person, but about a mathematical uh, concept that's that existed before Peter Diane, which is a graph based. It's it's based on graph theory, and the idea is that a similar concept exists in graph theory. And um, that, so if you, for instance, the success representation is the inverse of the graph Laplacian. That's like a very simple thing that's in graph theory and has very nice properties. Anyone who uses, who does spectral clustering is doing eigen decomposition of the graph Laplacian. And what the grid cells are, grid fields are doing, it's also basically decomposing uh, or kind of a spectral clustering of space as well at different scales. And the idea of reachability on graphs, which is on every node, if I take random walks, how often do I expect to visit a given other node that is multiple steps away? That idea existed in graph theory, exists now. It's, if you look at, for instance, uh, Physics Review or some of these other journals, which for some, because of my work in this field, actually I even review for them sometimes, um, you will see that this uh, approach in the graphs is used very often across disciplines it has existed in graph theory. I think that Pierre Dayan did a very wonderful job of showing that this decomposition that happened uh, between factorizing the reward and the sort of uh, representations of associations was very nice. Another nice property of it is that the temporal context uh, model that uh, was proposed um, by Mark Howard, uh, that actually, which is about episodic memory and how memories fade in the past and things like that, even the success representation even turns out to be a more generalized version of that. So it seems like it's, it, so I wouldn't consider it in a person oriented. Yeah, thing. I wasn't, I, I was, I was just oriented. doing it for, I wasn't, I understand. I mean, I can't possibly, I mean, I, I kind of know that I was taking my life into my own hands, asking a question about the successor representation with you here. But what I was trying to do um, was, to understand whether, in a sense, the discovery of place and grid cells was confirmation of the beautiful theory that I just talking about, or whether they were discoveries in their own right. I mean, I'm just trying to understand, or were they just waiting to confirm conceptual frameworks that pre-existed going into the hippocampus? In other words, which way are we supposed to take this story? Well, historically, place cells were discovered before the successor presentation, so. So, um, so Kavala, I mean, what, what are we supposed to be taking from this story? Is this an empirically driven story or a let's go around looking for confirmation of behavioral computational I, theories? I think more than anything, it tells you about uh, how neuroscience has changed, right? So we've moved, we are moving, and rightly so, from a discipline where we were essentially discovery driven, stamp, basically glorified stamp collecting. Hey, I found something weird. Isn't this cool? And we're now transitioning to a period where actually we have we have models that do more than just describe a bunch of things we've already seen, and they can sort of tie together what previously looked like unrelated phenomena. But didn't, that's, the, you know, that's one of the, but didn't the Moses the didn't the Moses really just describe a zoo of cells? In other words, I'm just trying to understand. Was it really? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's yeah, yeah, in a sense. But that's because there are still you know these experiments. So in other words, neuroscience hard, hasn't really you know, moved. Neuroscience hasn't really moved that far. I mean, that Nobel Prize only given. A few years ago, so so in other words, uh, I would say that given, right is stamp collection. 
it well it's still you know there's still a lot of brain left um, right so in other was, words work was yeah i mean we're starting you need a certain amount of data before you can start building and testing your theory um i okay. guess we probably hit a we probably hit a sort of critical mass in the spatial memory system in that I guess we've, you know, I'm sure there's other cell types left to see, but we seem to have got a bunch of sort of the big ones, at least in like this synapse through the hippocampus, with like three or four, um, circuit through the hippocampus, with three or four synapses. And so I think that's why we're now starting to see, you know, we've got enough. And now we're starting to see theories that can have a sort of, you know, establish sort of, you know, not just explaining this one bit, but actually give us sort of an overarching way of understanding, you know, if this is successor framework, then actually place cells should be able to respond to things that aren't spatial. If I learn a sequence of, you know, pressing buttons or whatever. Right. So and just to get to, to right. So to get to that. So in other words, if I understand it, then um, in your, you know, in your paper, you know, that came out recently, the review, not the review, but the piece with, about the Tolman Eichenbaum machine that, that came out in Cell, which is really, very lovely, um, where you make the case that you can go from these spatial relations to concept relations and graphs like Ida was talking about. So, so should I then come to the conclusion that in terms of this hippocampal arrangement and the ability to extrapolate from spatial navigation to, for lack of a better word, concept navigation, right, that the glue conceptually that lets us think about the anatomy, the cell types, the universe is a successor representation. Is that doing most of the conceptual work across space into concepts? Is 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 this Caswell? The, the, what's going I, I on? I can here? see Ida desperate. Well, hey, I, I know. Think, I don't think it's that's your I show don't today. That, <laughs> no, 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 I, I, I don't think that's such a crazy thing to say. Yeah, I mean, I you know, this is. I mean, we've got to ask ourselves what do we want to get out of neuroscience, right? We want we want some sort of general principles and general levels of understanding. And I think that's what we're looking for. I think that's what we I think that's what we're getting here. There seems to be, you know, and all models can be, you know, they can models only as good as until it's can be falsified, etc. But actually, our models are getting better, and we are able to make predictions, and we're able to account for a bunch of stuff that we've seen both in spatial and non-spatial domains. And so, yeah, I think we are, we are starting to find things that are the glue holding it together. I guess we need to be cognizant of the difference between something just written down as equations and how it might be implemented in the brain, which is, you know, a messy place that had to arrive at that solution by evolution with a bunch of other different constraints. But I think that's what we're starting to get to, right? That's like the difference between saying, oh, what, you know, what might be the success of features that this thing can run on? Like, they, yeah, and that's, and so we've taken a leap and now we're sort of iterating and trying to get a closer match to sort of this exact implementation that we've seen. Uh, and right? then my, uh, that's wonderful. And my last question, just because when I remember reading about Tolman's experiments and thinking about maps, and actually Mike Rascola, the philosopher, has a very nice paper on when is a map a map, right? Mm. When is it actually, when is a map actually, a topographic thing that you look at versus something that's working as if it were a map, right? And so yeah. I was just wondering, do you feel, and as you said, the successor representation lies somewhere between model based and model free. And I've always thought it was more on the model free side of things. Like Ida said, you're basically just learning, latently learning the states or the rewards, right? Um, I didn't so, say it's model free though. What, well, I, I, right. And I, I know, so what I'm saying is, is, Sometimes you can conceive of a map as a truly bona fide model based thing, right? I have a map of the subway and I look at it. So, where are model model maps versus these successor? Do, do you see what I'm saying? In other words, uh, 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 where's the Rascola map on his taxonomy, the one that's really a map versus map like? I mean, I'm not sure we guaranteed there is one. Right. I mean, it depends. It depends what you'd be happy with. I mean, you're never going to get something that has. All, well, Casey, maybe I should stop myself. I was about to say you're never going to get. I was going to say something try. Like you're never going to get anything that has sort of the key quality of a of a physical map is obviously that its topology preserves the topology of the world. And I was about to say we're never going to get something like that. Actually, there's you know there is some indications of that sort of structure in, in grid patterns, not just the different scales, but uh, work from Tank's lab 
showing that you know grids that represent similar points in space tend to be sim in similar locations in the brain, which I guess actually starts to meet your definition of a true map, albeit one in a rather distorted, strangely toroidal space. But I don't. Uh, what I was really going to say before I sort of thought that was, I'm not sure there's any guarantee that you'll find something that is a sort of pure or true map. I mean, there's people who disagree with me, and I'm sure some of them are very famous. I think John O'Keefe would would interestingly go hard on that. You know, no, it is. You know, hippocampus has all the qual. He would he would sit down and say philosophically, these are the qualities that a map has. You know, it has items in it, and it has a metric. And with grid cells and place cells, we have everything that constitutes a true map. I think it's more flexible than that, and I think seeing as we see it recruited in different settings and those aren't settings that char are characterized by true maps i'm not sure we expect one at all i think right. we find something that's actually quite flexible so the and paradox indeed, uh, i'm sorry go ahead finish i know i was going to say and indeed you know we've been like uh systems neuroscience like myself i guess calling myself systems neuroscience have been sort of spoiled by looking at rats running around in spaces like what did we expect to find rats running around in spaces consisting of solely walls it was it ever surprising that we find a bunch of sort of simple representations that are sort of uh represent the position relative to walls i think real world if we were to complete these studies on humans doing more complex things then we'd find it much harder to call things a map map Right. So in other words, the delicious sort of paradox after all this is it all started with somebody who believed in maps. Maps. It began to show a kind of mathematical structure, which was much more general than map maps. Yeah. That, that yeah. mathematical structure allowed you, if the question you were trying to solve was truly spatial, you could be map-like. If it was relational or conceptual, the same mathematical structure could do that. So yeah. actually we've moved away from the notion of maps really to a mathematical formalism that can be map like if that's the task it's being yeah. so compelled to do but if you give it another one that mathematical formalism can do it otherwise so we've actually gone a kind of gorgeous full circle in a sense away from map maps in a sense and i guess the, the remaining question is is this one about how baked in the implementation is is it is the system in a rat brain or a human brain sufficiently flexible that actually it can be deployed in all the different scenarios like theory dictates? Or actually has the brain had to take enough shortcuts that it's like limiting it to be, you know, in a rat? Maybe it is, maybe you are tied to a map map because that was just more efficient. And actually, mm -hmm. you know, for most of evolutionary history, rats needed maps more than they needed sort of the ability to think about things in a complex fashion yeah yeah i think it won't i don't think it'll be that hard i suspect we'll find something midway it'll be biased like they so i think mm -hmm. the answer in the hippocampus might be you know what it's kind of a spatial map but actually with these other potential layered on top of it it's probably what we'll find but it, it's one of the things that remain to be seen right what essentially the tension between the theory and the compromise of implement implementing it in a brain is the is the bit that we need to explore. Right. So, thank you. I hope I don't sound like I was. It's it just it, it's exactly where I kind of wanted you to go. I think that was really beautiful. And uh, thank you very much. Really great. Yeah, Thanks I so want much. to thank you too, Caswell. I've been uh, the the last summary that John made. I almost couldn't believe my ears. Like he talked so much clearly and in favor of mathematical formalism. And we have had so many conversations, so I'm so happy right now. I think that there is a philosophy of science difference there um, that I think maybe some of us uh, have a different idea of the math that, uh, you know, it doesn't matter which comes first. The point is that whenever you will discover something, there might be a mathematical formalism that will explain it. They could have been discovered separately in completely different fields and people might not have noticed any no, anything between them and they could have been at different times. But at some point when we can match the two, that's one of the biggest uh, sort of satisfactions of scientific um, yeah. moments. So I, I really appreciate that you took such a wonderful way. And I think John's questions were very on point and led the way nicely. Um, it's one of the big questions for us, isn't it? As neuroscientists, it's, you know, we can't we can't keep going around generating data without some sort of theories that unify them. But it, the thing that we don't know is how far we'll ever be able to go down that route. Like we'd like, you know, it's probably true. We'll never get as far as things like physics where you can write down a few simple, you know, few simple things that explain it all. The, the, the thing that I, I don't know and I often wonder about is how far we'll get towards that, whether it will be adequate to do that. You know, would would we be happy with an explanation of the brain that is like, you know, 
successor features and something else over here and you know will that do a good enough job to explain what you want to do maybe i guess it, it totally boils down to philosophically what you expect from your explanation i would prefer something like that to be honest i mean i can't believe i'm saying this to Ida, but i do feel that if you could show you know a kind of neural confirmation of a more abstract notion whether it's computational or algorithmic especially when it comes to these kind of things, I think it's the proper level of granularity to mm. say you're understanding the brain. I mean, mm. I don't really care what CA1 and CA3 and all the connections and all the biophysical details, no way. This is what I would like to hear. Mm. I mean, I, 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 this is being recorded, John. I will play this back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 it's great. Jovo, you've been quiet. I have. I've been listening. It's been really interesting. You know, I was talking to Coswell before we started, and my first year as a PhD student, I actually modeled hippocampus, and it's my first PhD paper. Um, and for a long time, it was my most cited paper, uh, which I wrote with my brother when he was in Ralph Etienne Cummins' lab. So we were very pleased about that. Um, so I wanted to, well, first of all, I just want to remark, it's 520. I know, Caswell, it's late for you. So I just am acknowledging that and I'm so grateful for all the time we spent. And um, I, I think rather than me trying to be brief, I'm going to try to say things that maybe lots of people can opine on um, and kind of open the floor rather than kind of. Can I just suggest that Caswell so, stops sharing so he can also see the chat? Great. Tim just showed up and said, hi, people have been sharing references. They've been appreciating, but you're missing all of that. It's true. No, I can, I'm, I'm not sharing now, right? Is that true? Okay, good. Right. Yeah. Yeah, great. So I want to take a, like, I'd ask a bunch of really interesting, very specific questions, and John really helped zoom out. I'd like to zoom out a bit further. This salon is really, like Ida says so eloquently in the beginning, it's about bridging contentions between biological and artificial intelligence. And so I just, I'm curious, from a person who is no longer modeling hippocampus, like, how does knowing that hippocampal place fields change their size as you get further from a wall inform me about how to build artificial intelligent agents? It's a, it's a good question, right? And there would be there would be one easy easy answer that may you know maybe doesn't, but I'm not going to go that route. Obviously, I mean, I think one of the questions you know one of the big questions of artificial agents at the moment is how do we you know and the big issue with artificial intelligence in general is how do we how do we teach you to generalize and transfer it's a you know it's a problem that's being dealt with uh but obviously it's tried to say the brain is really good at doing things like that with some limits we can transfer information from one context to another but presumably it's to do with the sorts of representation the sorts of ways we're able to represent those situations um and i i think what we'll see and indeed what as far as play cells go um the place code in the past was sort of described as being, you know, basically some random hash of space. It was like some beautiful sort of abstract thing that just gave you like a unique code for space. I don't think it is. And I think in a sense, we've known for a long time that it's not. There's like a whole bunch of results out there sort of showing, you know, if you ask place cells of experiments, they'll be like, yeah, we kind of know, you know, if I record a place cell in this box and it's in the corner, it tends to be in sort of sim, sort of, Sort similar sorts of places in another box. Cells that fire in the centre environment, more often than not, fire in the centre of the environment over here. So there's sort of statistical similarities, which isn't, by the way, what I was showing at all. We were like at a sort of level abstracted away from that. But I guess what I think, what I'm really saying is what the place code is doing isn't an abstract representation of space. It's capturing the features around you. It's a representation of the features around you at any given moment. And the reason it's smooth and moves smoothly is because space is smooth. The general part especially the experiments especially the rooms that we were doing experiments in the world you know the world moves smoothly as you move around uh deliberately so because the way we'd set it up and so i think our result is sort of tells you more about the simple processes the brain uses to govern its own behavior i think if you want to go and learn lessons about how you should implement the representation that works for ai or any form of agents then actually what you want is environments that have parameters in them that you're manipulating, highly parameterized environments. You can go away and change and ask how 
how the hippocampal population is representing the parameters in the world. And I think at that point, what you'll find is that you've got something that is efficiently representing latent states and relevant features that can be reused quickly and mean that when you represent when you see this feature again at some other point you can reuse the same some of the same code and that will allow you to execute some of the same behaviors in that place because they're likely to be rewarding so let me just see if i understand i'm, I'm going to try to box you into a corner basically so i apologize in advance but um Bill, I think you're saying that if we want to solve transfer learning, which is, you know, one of the canonical problems in AI right now, and out of distribution learning, generalization, you think we should study hippocampal place fields, and that will give us cues to solving these for problems. For in the spatial domain, right? Uh, not for, I'm not necessarily promising this will work across any domain, but I guess, I guess what I'm telling you is how I think the hippocampal code works and why that, is, why that is good and efficient in a biological system and what that would give you if you uh, transfer to an artificial agent. And I guess the bottom, the, the sort of the take home message from that is that the hippocampal code uh, is a representation of the world around you and all the relevant features in it, including transitions and you know, relative, uh, and relevant states. And that, that is a useful representation to have if you want to do things like generalize across different places that like give you states that are similar in some way or that might have uh, behaviors associated with those states that you want to repeat in other locations. I think I agree with all that. I guess to just be a devil's advocate a little bit, I would say, didn't I know that before anyone recorded a place field? I think we did. I think it's, so I think it's, let me, let me tell you a story. This thing, that really sort of surprised me about place fields. So I recorded place fields for, for a long time. And I used to think, this is amazing. Like you can look so deep into the brain and find this representation of something that makes sense. Just find that incredible in a way that maybe I didn't find like looking at V1 so incredible. And then, I don't know, five or six years ago, I trained a few deep networks to do some basic navigation thing and they all bloody had place cells in them. And um, in that moment when I looked at them, it's sort of, it, it, changed, it, it something became obvious that wasn't obvious to me before I'd seen these examples in different domains. And it was like, that, of course, this is, you know, given the constraints on this system, this is the sort of representation that you use if you want to represent a continuous space that you can move around in two dimensions. It, it isn't special. It was inevitable given these constraints. And I think without recording, without seeing examples, whether it came from model deep network let's call them models because they essentially are sort of slightly abstracted models of the brain um or biological examples these things just weren't true hindsight's hindsight's great once you've constrained the options that it could have been and i don't think that i don't think these things were necessarily obvious beforehand i think they are when you see it you're like of course it of course it was i just you know maybe it's my own naivety but when i when i saw that in both systems i was like you know this is you know yeah this is this is the this is the representation that you need to use that. It's hard to think of something uh, that would work as well, given the sorts of constraints you're working with and the constraints being, you know, noisy systems and things aren't always reliable, but a world that changes smoothly and slowly. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. I'm going to invite uh, other people because I want to so get more people Dennis, here. Uh, Dennis is the first. And then while Dennis is asking their question, there is also Dory. And Elle cannot join the screen, so she asked that we ask her question. Of course, you know Elle. Um, how do you reconcile the proposed visual-based explanation of place cell firing with the findings that place cells are still active in the dark? And during this time that you're answering, uh, Jovo is going to invite them. Hi. Hi. OK, so Hi. Um, Hi. thank you so much for that wonderful discussion and awesome talk as well. So I guess um, my question centers around place cell and what does it have to do with memories, right? Like does it have anything to do with memory representation? And um, I want to ask about, so if you see that the number of cells that represent the environment seem to, like the place cells, right, seem to scale with the size of the environment, then does the neural ensemble that stores the memory of that environment also scale or are there homeostatic, you know, rules like for plasticity that say, okay, we're just going to take the top 
thirty percent of you know cells to represent that mm -hmm. environment, and then that recent paper from Tom Hughes lab says you know these are like the CFOS positive cells. All the other cells that are play cells still do stuff, right? But they're not the ones that have plasticity changes that store the memory. So just curious what you think about that. These are really good questions. So, so, it, so it's interesting, right? So what we showed is sort of a homeostasis over sort of continuous space. And of course that changes when you consider the space. So it really changes things when you consider the space as a whole and you're like, if I want to remember this whole thing, then suddenly I've got all these cells to deal with versus if I wanted to remember a small thing, I've got these other cells to deal with. Yeah. And I, th I think probably there's a, a, there's a sort of obvious get out of that. The place cells, if you want to remember the sort of whole structure of the environment, it might not be up to the place cells at all. You're probably looking at sort of the structures upstream, the things that are telling you about the relative positions of places. You know, the you know, basically, I'm talking about the zoo of cells you find in the enteral cortex, like your the things that are representing the position of borders, barriers, the things that we think about when we define spaces. You know, like where's the edges of it, and how does that relate to each other? Presumably, keyed into a into yeah. a grid cell map. But then that still can't be the whole story, right? Like I can close my eyes and imagine walking around rooms I haven't been in for ages. Um, and presumably I'm engaging sort of a fairly rich, presumably homostatically regulated set of play cells when I do that. And so to a certain extent, they're there in memory and they're being pulled out. Um, how how they get stored in the interim is, is a bit unclear. Where, and what gets re-recruited, re whether whether I recruit, like you said, just the ones that you used to store with memory, or whether you sort of pull in some others to make up the numbers later, I guess these are questions we just don't fully know the answer to. I mean, I think one thing we do know is that um, with time, the active population is whittled down, and that would make you know that would make sense and be efficient. And this, you know, with this we see in these sort of longitudinal imaging studies. Um, I guess what I don't what I don't know, but what I should like to know is. You take one of those environments and look at the homeostasis. Is it broken in those situations or has something changed? And if you go back in there and have to start relearning things, do you re-engage? I guess that's a sort of the next tier of questions that we need to come to. So I'm not i I'm not not fully sure of it, but I think of the answer, but I think to go back to your original point, how do you, you know, how are you storing the whole environment? I think that's much more to do with where the where the ball, walls are, where the things are that control the transitions you could make probably is, yeah. the, is a nice way of thinking about. Yeah, so if I can just ask a follow-up question that's maybe a little bit more concrete, right? So you talked about Yori Buzaki's work looking at hub cells and, and fast-changing mm -hmm. cells. So as the environment gets larger, more complex, does the number or the composition of those hub cells or the slow-changing cells change? So we, we don't know because we can't separate them with um, uh, this electrophysiological method. I can tell you what I think happened. So I think those I think those cells are uh, another way, or the way I look at them is actually probably what you're seeing is a difference in the collectivity of the enteral cortex. I think the, the hubs, the ones that are laid down rapidly, the ones that pre-play, the ones that exhibit less plasticity are the things that are driven by your grid cell network, right? Those are, those are the things that can be rolled out quickly as you move into your environment, you don't know what to expect. You're essentially using path integration maybe to a greater extent. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. Um, you're essentially using path integration to a greater extent. And so those, if, and so we can extrapolate from that. We know if they're driven by grid cells, we assume this home is, this, I mean, if this homeostatic mechanism exists anywhere, it must be, it must, it, like, it must be at least present in the grid cells, given that we think they come from this, like, uh, this low dimensional manifold. And there's a lot of reasons to believe that's the case. So I guess then that gets you back to the other things. How about the other stuff? What's that coming from? Presume that that is the extra features, right? That is like the distinct visual cues that are changing and all of the other stuff that sort of, you know, maybe moves more slowly in places where the world moves less slowly, you know, because you're further from the walls and the rest of it. So I think that's the bit, I think it's those that are the ones that will uh, that will depend more on where you are relative to the walls. But I, I would strongly suspect hub cells are, are tied into the grid cell network quite deeply. So before Denise goes, um, I want you to follow up on her question just because you said, presumably, if I imagine something in the dark or I imagine that presumably yes. I use clay cells, why do we have to use clay cells at all? In other words, you know, uh, HM could imagine things. So, oh, could he? No, could so, that's, so that's what I want you to ask about yeah. is, 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 we, we is, is are you yeah. making, are you making uh, an extrapolation gratuitously or do you really believe that when I imagine you know, the Minecraft building that I want to build that I'm actually using my clay cells. 
So, so we, can I just make a comment about the hippocampus versus parietal cortex for various kinds of imagery? Mental rotation you can do with your parietal cortex, so if you don't have MTA, and that has been shown. But various kinds of uh, compositional imagination you can't. So HM could do mental rotation, and some people who say, "Oh, look, they could do imagination," they just mean one specific kind of thing that parietal cortex can do. So just wanted to say that. Sorry. Go I mean, ahead. and 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 but just HM, if I remember correctly, could draw a map of where he grew up as a child, right? But he couldn't so, learn a new map. That's how, but how? But yes. how did he draw the map? It was consolidated the, into the cortex. Right. So I'm just asking. I'm fine. I'm just saying is when are we? I just want to know how or how firm ground are we on when we look at real maps or imagined buildings or imagined route that place cells definitely have to be involved. I'm I'm not actually being polemical. I want to know whether you're how firm a ground are you on for that? Kind of so, so two two. We don't know if definite. But two pieces of evidence in my favour, I guess, on this. So, uh, so you stick people in the brain scan, and then you can, uh, and then navigating normally, you can detect grid cell activity, or rather, you can see the sort of six-fold pattern of grid cells being engaged. And that gets engaged. You just ask them to ima like imagine you're standing here, travelling in that direction. So they don't actually have to be moving. So that indicates that you're at least engaging a grid cell system um, during its sort of imagination in this form. Um, which is very likely to engage hippocampus. But the, the flip side is, in fact, if that word from Demis Hassabis of DeepMind fame, uh, before DeepMind, he looked at uh, human patients with hippocampal damage and asked them to imagine things. And in fact, the patients with hippocampal damage had these like really, really sparse, non-spatial. So if you ask them, say, imagine you're standing on a beach and all you get back is um, the sky is blue. Um, and, and they're not rich. They weren't overtly spatial in that things weren't related to each other. And so it looks like it looks like while you can while you can summon semantically some of the things that might be on a beach, you can't assemble them into a scene. Interest, interesting, they haven't this is I I'm falling into like the, the full O'Keefean view. This is sort of John's hard view of the hippocampus. Sure, you can you can consolidate stuff out of it. But if you want to experience that, you either there's a spatial scene you're perceiving or even remembering, then you need it to be there and active. It's sort of the hard line. I'm not sure I'm quite that hard line, but I think I'm probably not that far from it. Did I enter the right paper in the chat, Caswell? I think it's this one. Patients with hippocampal yeah. amnesia can't imagine new experiences. I think it must be. Oh, I've clicked on it now. I'm going to lose you all. The title it, it, it must, yeah, that's got, that, I'm pretty sure that's it. I'm 95% certain that's the one. Well, thank you so much. I have to go feed my hungry children. So um, I'll see you guys later, but this is really great. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thanks. All right, Dory, do you want to? Yes. Hi, Caswell. Um, Hi, thank Dory. you for the talk. <laughs> I was just wondering, because um, obviously you, you have you have touched on this a little bit, but obviously we're talking about mice in quite a sort of, you know, sport environment, not very realistic. How does this sort of fit in with mice actually, you know, navigating through a very rich environment, like maybe a forest? And also how does that tie in with how, um, you know, representation like this might have evolved in an environment like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. these are really, you know, these are really good questions. And our environments are sparse and deliberately sparse, right? Like when you're in the, when you're a little rat sat in the middle of that three meter and a bit, three meter a bit uh, environment, you're a long way from, uh, anything sort of meaningful as a spatial cue. And I think that's kind of what that final analysis is just showing you. Like if you look at the visual world and you move a bit, it still looks the same basically, because everything's far away. You've got tiny little eyes with relatively limited ability to resolve fine details. But it means you give, if you take that as being a fair indication of how things are, it doesn't mean you can ex abstract to or extrapolate to what scenarios would look like with richer cues. And indeed, we, we know some of this already from some experiments, right? Uh, indeed, going back maybe 15 years, Robin Heyman, when he worked with Kate Jeffrey, did some experiments. They had big rooms and they had things in the middle and they started taking some of those things away. And you and you see, you know, the fewer the fewer cues the hippocampus has got to work with, the less rich it becomes like the fields get bigger and they spread out and they get a bit more unstable and he ultimately got down to this scenario where there was nothing except a loud scary noise that would drive the rat back into the middle of the room if it tried to get near the walls and even that was unreliable 
and he just saw, you know, at, at that point, you've just got, you've taken it to the extreme where you've got sort of rather unstable population of cells. I'd love to go back and check the dynamics of that to see if that's still got the homeostasis in it. But, it, it, you know, in a sense, the answer is clear. The more, the more spatial cues you've got to work with, the more you'll be able to recruit smaller, fine-tuned, stable cells. And when you haven't, you're still tied by the same homeostatic mechanism. It's still going to be the same number active, but you're going to get through them less quickly. Things will just turn over slower, so the, the scale of everything will be larger. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> I can see them. I realise I can read the messages now. I should start a podcast if I can. <laughs> Maybe I should. Hi. Hi, please go ahead. Oh, hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, we can hear Yeah. Okay. So my question was kind of, I, I saw like some content from my question, a number of other people, and you already a little bit answered on the question. So I will a little bit rephrase. So I was amazed that the, um, this is not a mapping, but actually it's more sparse mapping of the intermediate, like central places in the open field. Exist. I'm kind of a little bit off from the hippocampal field. So, so the question you're saying, can what extent that is actually uh, reflecting some sort of informational space? Because we can imagine that in the middle of that field, it's like no biologically, it's no more difference for you. Like you are five five centimeters left or right, but there's much bigger difference for the five centimeters left or right next to the wall. Uh, of course, there are possibilities that, um, I mean, re requirements that if you try to analyze that, you need to dissociate the possible effects of, for example, uniformity of exploration. And I see in your example from the slide, uh, one of the slides of computational simulations that uh, on the level of computations, uh, you did, or, you, or the previous person from last uh, meeting, they did take into account homogeneous uh, nature of exploration itself, because that artificial rat explores space homogeneously everywhere, but despite mm -hmm. of it, you receive that uh, information relevant uh, picture of uh, space. So that is the, uh, the question and the uh, additional kind of uh, little Sub question is so that 12 percent it's amazing like so is it in your view is it like the new kind of um constant of the of the universe universe like in addition to five or it is a, <laughs> or it is just a member of some universal function you need you, we still need to discover well that's a, that's an interest those i mean those are good questions they're very good questions so just to sort of uh rephrase the first one it's like can we find can we find any sort of sort of theoretical reason, maybe information theoretical, why it is you should have fewer cells in this area where you've got um, less information, less spatial information? And I suppose I'm already picking the words the way that I, so I, I would imagine there might be a link there, right? That if you were trying to sort of, if you were trying, like if you were trying to maximize the mutual information between your sensory experience. I'm, I'm sure this, I haven't thought about it enough, but I'm sure there is some framework you can put this into that is probably more satisfying than saying the simple thing. Because at the moment I've just said the simple thing, right? Which is basically you're moving through the cells proportional to the rate you're moving through the sensory world. And if you took that at face value, you know, you might say, oh, well, it just means, you know, maybe the animals don't appreciate how rapidly they're moving. But that seems to be a ridiculous suggestion. Um, and so it must be something deeper than that, right? You'll try, you know, it, it, it's not, it's probably not like that for an accident. It's probably, um, it's probably some constraint on uh, how overlapped or how sort of common the information is between neighboring place cells there's no point packing them too close because they start to become redundant if you don't have sufficient information to sustain that sort of stability and so I, I imagine there's a link in there i haven't thought about it enough to give it you exactly but um i will certainly think about it a little bit more as for the 12 percent i don't know um i guess i guess 
before before I start touting it as uh, the new constant, I would like to do more. I would like to see those rats sort of more aroused or subject to, to like heightened novelty and just see how stable it is. Like once I once I've satisfied myself, you can't shift it around too much with the sort of obvious neuromodulators. Then maybe I'll start getting more excited about it. But it'll be essentially it'll ultimately boil down to being a property of how highly connected the hippocampal network is. And how active can you go trading off like metabolic cost versus as well the chance of having seizures by going too active is ultimately what it'll be bounded by, I would imagine. Yeah. So for example, if you change the kind of as I understand from your from the um place sales field, you actually distribute the uh pellets all over the yeah. environment. So that gives you homogeneity of the kind of motivation and you by doing so you forget about that but actually it is one of the most very powerful kind of fun, uh, like a uh, factor that actually help hippocampus maybe to um, engage in so much because you actually receive pellets what about if you repeat the your experiment with this double space I love it but full the, but pull, but uh, distribute the pellets only in half of each of those spaces. This so this is an interesting thing actually. We have so we didn't do it in this, but in a previous study we did, and there was which slightly ties into this. And it's something that I've always found a bit of a mystery and slightly annoying. Um, so a previous study we did with a um, student who was Francis Carpenter. Um, we recorded grid cells in two joint, basically it was one of these classic experiments where you have two environments and there's a corridor you can get between them. And the main result we found reported in the paper was, you know, if you give the rats enough, to start with, the grid pattern is identical in the two environments. But if you give it enough time going backwards and forwards, you end up with um, a global representation across it. But the, the interesting side thing was it takes a long time. It took about 20 hours of recording to get before it sort of turned a globe pattern. And so we tried this thing that we colloquially in the lab call like boosting, like where we just get the rat, and leave it in there for a few hours and not be there throwing rice to sort of get it to do stuff. But it would move around a bit. I mean, well, basically, it didn't really seem to learn much, which was quite surprising. Like you didn't, when you went and checked the grid cells, you'd be like, right, it's been in there 20 hours. Let's go and have a look, see if they're global. It'd be like, huh, nothing's changed. You have to be, it's partly because on their own, they explore a bit, they hit some criteria, and then they go and sit in the corner because I guess exactly. now they, yeah. Um, and you don't consider so, that as an answer. And you don't consider that as an answer to the question, yes? Well, that is a well, problem. I, because that is the answer. It I doesn't think gotta, the, actually the, the brain, it doesn't. It doesn't yeah, spend gotta, energy on that. Well, so it's interesting, isn't it, that um, Clearly, there's something you know. We would assume that there's a you know again in the animal there's a form of balance. Like there's a, it's important to explore up to a certain point until presumably you can predict what's going to happen with some degree of fidelity. But beyond that, it's not worth your while exploring because it's metabolic and costly. And it's interesting that threshold isn't at the threshold that you can reach if you force it to move around doing tasks, going backwards and forwards, or or running around. And I guess not wishing to sort of undermine my own experiment, try as you might. And so Sander spent ages designing this thing that would, we monitor where the rat is and we drop pellets where it wasn't to try and make it run around evenly. It's really hard to get. It's really, like, they don't like, rat, animals don't like exploring evenly for various reasons. I mean, rats feel slightly less safe in the middle. They like to stick to the walls, even well-trained ones. And so it's it's really hard to contr control for and, you know, both in a good and a bad way, some of these annoying sampling biases. I mean, you can run the animals for ages and like look at the you know and try and subsample it but you still can't get around the fact that they've spent more time running along the walls than they have like running around in the middle of the environment the, the i guess these are the experimental challenges to be solved i think that was more, more questions rather than answers to the question i'm sorry yeah. thank, thank you, you. So thank you thank you for asking okay we next have mihai Hello. Hi. Hi, Kazwa. Um, so you suggested that uh, place of firing fields are related to the position uh, near the wall. So as it were, um, they would be modulated by boundary cells, perhaps. I was wondering if you could comment sort of from a 
from an evolutionary perspective, um, you know, why are there boundary cells at all? Like um, rats don't grow up in like one by one boxes with people in white coats looking at them. Um, they kind of, the, the evolution happens in a um, much more mm -hmm. unstructured environment. So, you know, what would constitute a boundary in an open field? Um, how would play cells, um, you know, arise there mm -hmm. if, if there are no walls, if there are no boundaries, yeah. or perhaps if the animal makes up boundaries in some way? Um, you know, how does that happen? So, so I've got two answers to that. I've got the, what is the standard answer? And then I've got a slightly heretical answer, which I'm also going to give you. Uh, so, so the standard answer, of course, is that actually the, the real world, the natural world, or whatever you call a rat's natural world these days, I mean, they do very well in sewers, et cetera, it is full of structure, right? It's easy for us looking down on the field or whatever to be like, oh, look, that's a field full of grass. But actually it's, it's full of huge amounts of structures. Animals' behavior is very structured in environments. You know, they run along... You know, if you look at how rats explore space, they travel along certain rat runs and then they'll switch to like an open field foraging. And when they want to come back, they'll come along rat runs. They spend lots of times in burrows, which are highly constrained. And so it's definitely true, um, maybe more so than we, we give them credit for, that rats' worlds are probably highly uh, constrained by borders and boundaries, even in the natural world. What's clearly different in the natural world is those borders and boundaries are probably more diverse. They're not like four sheets of perspex. They'll be like, you know, the side of a tree, a bit of a burrow, where the grass edge is. And I guess that means two things. It means um, what we call what we call sort of boundary cells. And I guess just to sort of to make it clear for everyone. So I've, I've called them two things, right? I've called, so the things that respond to borders in the entorial cortex have been christened border cells by the Moser group. Uh, so I think it was Solstad uh, who um, identified them. Whereas the ones identified by Colin Lever um, in the subiculum are often called boundary vector cells. Um, and superficially, are pretty. we could treat them as pretty similar. There are some theoretical differences. but um, And so I'm, I'm, I'm probably talking about both. It's interesting. And so when Colin Lever has looked at um, boundary vector cells from the subiculum, they respond to any sort of boundary. They're not, they're not, particularly sensitive to the uh you know the specific quality of that even to the extent of say if you've got the you've got a wall there and then you remove it now there's a drop so it's still an impediment to movement but it's actually sensorily pretty different probably as different as you can manage it being but you can still recruit the same boundary vector cell to fire against it and so just to round off the original answer before i go to the heretical answer probably what it tells you is these things really do look like they're abstracted to deal with any sort of thing that is an impediment to movement, be that the wall of a burrow, the bit of grass you don't want to go across because the cat's on the other side or whatever. The heretical answer is this. I don't think they respond to borders and boundaries at all. Um, I suspect they are more about transition. I, well, I suspect they're more representing the transitions animals can make, right? And it's just that rats spend an awful lot of time transitioning against along walls and borders. And that would explain something that's slightly missing. So in the in the original theoretical formulation of boundary vector cells, to drive place cells, you're going to be able to find them at all distances from and directions from walls. Whereas when you record them, you can find a few like that, that are sort of offset from the wall. But actually most of them are like, you know, a rat's whisker, literally a rat's whisker, which is about 10 centimeters away from the walls. And the same is true of border cells in the interrhinal cortex, maybe even more so. Uh, they're right up there at the points where so they don't fully match the theory. And I think I've said to someone beforehand, it's interesting because there are a really digressing, but I hope you don't mind. They're one of the few examples in neuroscience where there was a pre-existing theory. We found something that looked like it matched it really well. And in those scenarios, that's awesome because that's what we want to be doing. But also there's a slight danger that because it's such a rare thing to do, you find something that's a pretty good match. And you're like, that's one of those. We know about these. And in fact, you're overlooking maybe subtle differences. And so I, I I wonder whether we're going to sort of see a slight re, re sort of reimagining about what they actually are. And that actually these things are without wanting to get too excited by sort of representing transitions, but these things might be more about the routes that animals commonly take. And so that would explain why they're insensitive to whether there's a drop or a wall, right? Because it's still 
you can't travel over it you're going to travel along it that would explain why you see those other things commonalities to things like that it's nothing to do with the sensory structures it's more to do with like the routes that you can take and it would also explain why you know even so one of the nice things that colin lever showed was even if you pull apart something so a rat can jump over it if it had to um, but it's still that gap is enough that the boundary vector cell will still fire against it and it's and it's not because it's a now a barrier to impediment it's just because it still spends most of its time going up and along like this because it's a bit more effort to jump over the transitions aren't across it and i'm increasingly wondering whether that might be the case so caswell just to that uh host's prerogative to that question you just got asked about so another question which i didn't never got back to is all these different the zoo of cells on the one level they can be seen as evidence as we were discussing of other formalisms but do you think that you know i think stefano fuzzi had a paper recently where he claimed that really you could get place and, and direction orientation out of a population and some of the cells there were not place cells at all right in other words that it's really a population construct conferred upon a cell versus its unique status perhaps due to connectivity so do you think that maybe some of these zoo cells are constructed their repertoire that is constructed out of a population and evidence versus a hardwired property that was always there so what's your view on sort of circuit you know mm. baked mm. in identity versus look yeah, yeah. this is just the computation that this environment required and this identity has been conferred upon a cell by its population do you see the difference yeah yeah, yeah. no i do i do yeah, yeah. It's a really good question, right? And um, for some cell types, I think there's relatively uncontroversial answers. And probably the least controversial is something like a heterection cell. And the reason for that is is twofold, is that, you know, as far as we can tell, unlike things like play cells, the only place we see head direction cells being recruited is they represent the direction head points in. And we have a really good theoretical understanding of the network that drives it. And if, you know, and there's pretty good evidence. I mean, in flies, there is even a, there's literally a ring attractor, um, in which case it's only really going to be good for one thing. It's just a, it's a really low dimensional circular manifold representing which direction head goes in. And I can't think of a, a stronger case for like that one is hardwired. As you start to get further away from it, it starts to get a little bit knotty. I mean, the next one you get to is grid cells, which, you know, the evidence is less complete, but it probably is on balance, it looks like another example of where you've got these sort of, at least as far as a single grid module, so that's the set of grid cells at the same scale and orientation. It does look like another example of quite a highly specialized network um, where you see, you know, these cells that probably are just good for maybe not representing space, but at least representing continuous spaces. So not physical, necessary physical space, because no grid cells could be recruited in more abstract things. But it's still a hardwired construct that is good for continuous spaces. After that, you start to get on slightly thinner ice. Um, you know, because we don't, you know, we don't have hard models of how place cells form, not in the same way that you can just be like, I can hard code it all in the network and get like, you know, I can tell you which place I was going to find next to another one. We just, we don't have that. We have sort of higher level understandings of how they respond in certain settings. And as a result, I think there's a lot more scope for them to be kind of general purpose is what you're asking. And sort of they might, what they look like and your current definition wouldn't match what they look like in a different setting. I think that's going to be highly likely. Of course, it's not helped by the fact that it's, there's not really a very satisfactory definition of a place. It's quite hard to come up with a really good definition of a place cell. And as a result, it can be quite confusing to say, you know, as, as I think John O'Keefe once said to me, you know, he said, I spent 20 years trying to prove, like, what, trying to prove that what makes a place cell is not that it fires in one place. And what he meant by that was kind of that, right? Just because a cell fires in one place doesn't make it a place cell. His point being that it's like an abstract construct of like, you know, the whole ensemble of things around you. And that's quite hard to define. Mm -hmm. And it means that whatever definition we come up with probably won't match all scenarios. And so you just end up in this really difficult situation where you can't come up to an an for an answer with this unless unless someone else can come along and give us a nice theory that binds it together and says, you know, this is how to understand it. We might we might have that. We've discussed that today. And we, you know, ideas like success representations are kind of looking strong in that space. Hmm. 
Can Thank I ask you. a quick follow up on um, my question about boundaries? So, yeah. um, and this is going to be um, a little bit more speculative than like pushing your um, heretical answer, so to say. Um, I was wondering, like, of course, there aren't experiments in like, you know, wolves and hyenas and whatever, but um, would your routing argument potentially explain a sort of more conceptual boundaries where there isn't a physical boundary in a territory um, for these sort of animals, but they have the concept of a boundary. Um, you know, there isn't a physical barrier, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I would, I would, um, I would strongly, strongly think so. Um, and I suppose you could set up an experiment quite easily, right? I mean, so if, I suppose a, a sort of territorial boundary is quite a sort of a uh, nuanced thing. But essentially, it's probably some. You could almost think of it as like, can you get a boundary to some like a foot shock stimuli? Right, if the foot shock stimuli happens there and there's a boundary go in, would that be treated as a boundary? I don't know. I can't. Have, surely someone must have done that. I can't think of that being in the literature. Um, but I imagine it must. I would very, be very surprised if that wasn't treated as a boundary. I don't think it has to be a hard boundary. And indeed, both my definitions will work for that because animals will skirt regions like that. So you get the transition boundary. But also because it's a, a meaningful transition in space, I would imagine that it should be treated as a boundary. I'd like to know now. Maybe someone can. That must exist in literature. Maybe it that all sounds a little bit like a you know, sort of classifier between what might be considered safe or within and what's outside of. Almost becomes like a support vector. Well, or, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, it's any, but it would be more abstract than that, right? It would just happen to be that, um, you know, those, you know, these are two places that are distinct, I guess is what we're saying, whether there's a representation that distinguishes that. I suppose there's some interesting, it's not quite the same, but since it's been pointed out a few times, is, you know, play cells love a doorway. Like, if you go and look at recordings, you know, these recordings where animals come out into corridors, they get all these clustered, like, interesting sort of cells around the, around the doorways and the transitions. Like, they're in, they're important to the animal behaviorally, but also they are neurally distinct in some ways. Of course, it's also going back to what I was telling you about the visual scene changes particularly rapidly as you move through a doorway. Probably.